Hello and welcome to the RPA and state and local government webinar today presented to you by the RPA project team here at ATARC. It's two o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. I want to pass it over to our moderator for today's event. He is the CTO Evangelist for Private Sector at UiPath, Jim Walker. Jim, over to you. Super, thank you. Thanks all of you for joining our webinar today. Um, it, it's exciting time to be an RPA. I'm the, also the co-industry uh, leader at the ATARC RPA Working Group. So on behalf of our team of about 12 people, uh, government and private sector, thank you for joining today. Uh, for those of you on the call that are new to RPA, let me congratulate you for being on one of the biggest RPA webinars dedicated to state and local government to date. Um, in the in the two years I did RPA at NASA before retiring and now three years with UiPath, I've not seen an in-person or virtual webinar that had the quality of the presenters or the importance of their stories that you're going to hear today. It, it really is going to be a treat. Uh, while RPA was demonstrating value in the federal government prior to 2020, uh, we had 70 some odd agencies using RPA. Last year, it really began to make its presence felt in state and local governments as well as institutions of higher education. California, Ohio, Florida, Mississippi, Maryland, uh, they all started to use it to tackle their unemployment insurance issues, food stamp renewal programs, court fee payments, customer sentiment analysis, and even affordable health care applications with RPA. Uh, and even one uh, county that I'm aware of that has started using RPA with uh, artificial intelligence. So not only did it get started well and start to show value in uh, 2020, it really took off. And all of these are achieving the goals of moving employees from low value, but absolutely necessary work. And I'm going to repeat that. Low value work is what RPAs always talks about. Low value doesn't mean that it's not necessary. It's just not necessary that a person does that work. And that frees them up, as one young Air Force tech sergeant said on a a version of the Air Force Shark Tank, it liberated him to do higher value tasks that improves compliance, helps you with audits readiness, it reduces errors and processing time, and really creates the conditions for higher productivity, satisfactions in your employees, and reduces the cost of government, but also improves the service that you deliver to citizens. So in addition to the states that we mentioned today, we've got four agencies from three states today. And I'm going to take just a second to introduce those to you. Um, from the um, um, Texas, we have Kirshna Edithill, who is the Director of Enterprise Solution Services in Texas. We have Scott Mastelon, uh, the Commissioner of Suffolk County Department of Information Technologies in New York. We have David Brandon, who is the Director of Enterprise Services at the Texas Attorney General's Office, and we have Siva Apapo, Program Manager, Data Analytics, AI, and RPA for the New Jersey Courts. So one of the first things I would hope for all of you to appreciate is we're going to show you that RPA is not built for a industry. It's built for anything that uses a mouse, a keyboard, and a screen that does highly repetitive, rules-based type of work. So gentlemen, can we take just a second and have each one of you introduce yourselves so that our audience can kind of get a feel for who you are. Uh, Krishna, let's start with you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, like Jim said, uh, leads uh, RPA AI initiatives here in Texas. And I, you know, these kind of events are great uh, for not only for us, but everyone who is trying to put RPA, this gives a lot of confidence. So I wanted to thank you all for, you know, helping us uh, and, you know, inviting us to this platform. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, how you doing? My name is Scott Maslon. I am the, the, the commissioner of IT over here in Suffolk County. We're one of two counties located on Long Island, New York. Population here in Suffolk County, about 1.5 million. We have about 9,000 employees here, and I've been the CIO for about five years. And we recently implemented our a little over a year now, about 13, 14 months, we have uh, implemented an RPA program that originated with COVID, and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, but has been uh, extremely successful, and we're definitely happy to, to share our stories here um, with the group. Welcome. David? 
Hi, I'm David Brandon. I am the End User Services Director for the Texas Office of the Attorney General. Uh, we've been doing uh, robotic process automation. Actually, we went live uh, about a year ago next week. Uh, and, and similar, Scott, to your situation, we had some COVID issues, uh, and, and that's what spawned the need for a robotic process automation. But uh, thank you for inviting me to be a part of the panel. I appreciate it. Glad to have you. And Siva. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, I am Siva Pavel. I am from New Jersey Coats. And as Jim mentioned, I'm one of the program managers responsible for innovation and adoption of some of the disruptive technologies out there. Um, RPA is one of that. I also am responsible for uh, data analytics, AI, machine learning, blockchain, you name it. Uh, but we, uh, as the other uh, speakers mentioned, we jumped into RPA during the COVID times. It's been very successful. I'm glad to share my story with you here as well today. Great, glad to have you. And you, you saw in the comment box, but I just really wanna encourage those of you that are on the call, you can ask any question you want and we would love to drop off of our script and really answer your questions. So feel free to light that question and answer box up and we will put some questions out there. Uh, today, we're gonna to focus on RPA. And I bring that up so that the audience appreciates that RPA is a tool in the artificial intelligence or the intelligent automation world. You have RPA, you have AL, um, AI, machine learning, natural language processing, chatbots. And so we're gonna focus on uh, RPA, but I will suggest to you that anybody on this panel today is either looking at or using one of these other intelligent automation um, tools and they are creating an environment that is an enterprise solution of virtual employees augmenting their staff, right? And so for those of you that are on that haven't seen RPA before, this software is gonna emulate the human actions of seeing your screen, touching your data via the mouse and entering data based on a standard set of business rules. In the virtual world, these digital labor, it's like a cruise control on your car. It's easy to understand. You know exactly what you're doing when you press the button and everybody has it. It works with a self-parking car and every self-driving car will also have the RPA um, cruise control. So it's relatively inexpensive to train and to use. Um, and so I wanna help you focus on one part of the story today. Each speaker is gonna tell you about tasks that are being automated and not jobs. And I think that is critically important because if you don't understand that, you're thinking, oh no, robots are coming to take my job. Robots are coming to take the task that you have never gone home and told your family you do. It is the, I had to scrape 52 web pages to get some prices to do some type of procurement. It is 16 fields off of a court docket that just have to be put into a spreadsheet. It's that necessary work that government does that's not, again, necessary for a person to do. Um, so it may sound like a nuance to say that they're coming to help you with your task and not coming to take your job. But in the more than 79 deployments I've seen in the federal government, and now we're in about 25 states doing the boring, mundane, tedious work, I've never seen anybody go, well, I'm not needed, I'll be leaving tomorrow. Most agencies are saying, oh, we've needed a person for months. We've needed three people for months. We can put you on a program that we've been really trying to get to because it needs people. Okay. So if you think of these digital interns or as the, uh, the Air Force actually calls them digital airmen, right? Digital assistants. If somebody offered you an intern for the summer, there's no way you'd say no. If I tell you I'm going to offer you a digital intern, why would you say no? You know, don't make me pre-process all the applications for unemployment. Let the bot pre-process. Bring me in to do the hard thing of the person who's on the borderline of yes or no for unemployment. And let me try to figure out how we get to yes. You know, let the person who's on a food stamp program at the beginning of COVID get automatically renewed by a bot, but not automatically yes, but the bot go and check the three databases that a person did and take the people who were doing renewals and move them to the front office because at the beginning of COVID, the front office of the food stamp program was packed. Citizens were there for help, socially distanced with their mask on, but they were there for help. They don't wanna hear that, well, we got half our workforce in the back doing renewals, right? So today we're gonna to focus on RPA. For those in the federal government, 
It's always the joke with state governments. We print money, the states don't. So I really like for you to listen today about the idea that bots are going to help you with your budget issues. And it's going to lower your costs and allow you to keep dollars in your organization to do your mission. In March of this year, there was a great report out by the National Association of State CIOs. And what it did is it kind of validates what we've seen all year long, which is the idea that states are starting to increase the use of automation, right? And particularly, they started, are starting to use it with a chat bot. And so I'll just very quickly, a chat bot is gonna answer questions for you and it, that's a great and a wonderful thing, but then nothing happens other than yeses or noes. But if you tie automation with that RPA and says, I need to know about a W-2 form and the chat bot tells the, the RPA bot, hey, go grab a W-2 form and present it to this person. And if you're really smart, pre-populate with their information that you have in the database about them. So all they have to do is do a quick review and say, yes, that's me and click enter. Now I have the same uh, respect for my government that I have from Uber, from American Airlines, from FedEx and from all those other places who are automating my life and I'm happy to have it. And so RPA and automation really will give the, the government an opportunity to start creating a more digital government. And anytime I deposit my, a check that happens to come to my house from my dining room table, I'm thrilled that there's a bot doing that work for me. So Kristen, let's lead off with you today. Can you tell our audience what challenge led you to RPA Describe for us what your current bot or bots look like and what they're doing and what's been the impact on your program. Uh, thank you, Jim. And firstly, you know, I want to thank you for that real explanation so we don't have to say why we do RPA. But in Texas, we were mainly focused on transformation, cloud transformation. And I see it as three, you know, three areas that why we went to RPA. The first one is, as per the rule of transformation, you need to excite people, you need to energize people, and you you need to create and send passion passion down the line so that they get excited. Mm -hmm. And then the second one in that is there should be training, there should be budget, and there should be coaching, everything involved. And the third one is you need to sustain it. So with the budget cycle of close to, you know, 30, 29 to 30 months and all the government constraints that I didn't think of, RPA was the easiest answer for me that the transformation to happen to do all the three goals, I, I thought RPA was the best way to go. The second one was help. Uh, you know, you don't need a million dollars to get into RPA. You can go and sell this to any senior leadership. And especially given the fact that I was able to, or we were able to do it because, you know, Paul Graber came from UiPath and he said, look, we have community support and we have this, you know, trial test licenses that made it very easy for us to get the ball rolling. So we don't have to go to procurement and, you know, try to get those things. So th that is the second one. It was easy to ent enter into. The third one is what, you know, Jim talked about. People were struggling in the sense, you know, some of the people were not having work-life balance that, you know, I have a story of, of a manager who came to us and told us, look, my staff doesn't go to, you know, when you go home, my, my team is working, uh, you know, trying to reconciliate telecom bills. Can you imagine, you know, when you have a dispute in a telecom bill, how difficult it is to get that resolved? And imagine when we are to do, resolve the, the all of Texas government bills uh, that comes in and they manually enter it into the system and they go spreadsheet one line at a time. And then by the time they don't even see weekends, they don't see kids, they don't have a family work-life balance. And that, that, that really, uh, you know, uh, forced us to, you know, really look at in detail and we kicked off a proof of concept and you won't believe somebody was scanning it, you know, like Jim said, a, a, an invoice into an Excel spreadsheet and they took eight hours to do it. And the board was able to do it in you know, two, three minutes. So imagine that freedom that gives to that person and they can go and do cool things. So that was the, the whole idea. So, so these were the three main reasons why we were able to do it. And, and we were able to achieve about, you know, uh, reduce the, the number. And one of the great story is, you know, Texas Workforce Commission, you know, and I'm, I'm sure David will talk about the attorney general success story, but Texas Workforce Commission, when they launched the Larry, the chatbot, as of yesterday, uh, you know, four point, uh, I'll give you exactly the stat, 3.6 million Texans 
answering about 16.8 million questions. Imagine that in English. And because of that success, they launched another Spanish version and that answered about 36,000 uh, uh, questions. Uh, 36,000 uh, people asked the question and the response was about you know, 182 questions, right? So it's a massive amount of, you know, imagine all those people were not able to do that in this pandemic. Uh, and, and I see that as a great impact. And in two other bots, we saved about 300 uh, hours per week, uh, especially again during COVID. And I don't want to put numbers against it, but you can do the math. 300 hours, if you were to give it to a consulting firm, you know, how much that would be you know, for, the, for the rest of the year. Nice, great examples. Yeah, and it just, it's so much flexibility. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, Scott, let's turn to you. You and I spoke around this time a year ago uh, you had just started your RPA program because of COVID. Would you mind sharing why RPA, what your challenges were, and and, and what you've got in your program up to date? Sure. So uh, you know, so COVID obviously was uh, was difficult for all. Uh, we were we were introduced with a significant amount of effort that um, you know we ultimately um, weren't prepared for to a certain degree. Uh, the, the additional work that was that came along with um, you know the the patients, um, the positive patients, and the lab results and things of that nature that came along with it, um, and uh, we were we were struggling. Uh, we were we were one of the hardest hit counties uh, in the country uh, with thousands of cases on a daily basis. And what we, what we initially had started to do um, was, uh, you know, given the fact that we're we're a county, we were relying on the on the state as it relates to capturing um, information uh, related to uh, positive cases and, and lab results. Uh, we were downloading information from the state systems, um, reading through various PDF images, determining uh, whether or not it was a positive or or a, or a negative case, writing on the forms, distributing them to. Um, to our, our, our nurses and ha having them actually, um, you know, make the contacts, the initial contacts to determine uh, whether or not there was any issues and, and to inform the, the individual patient. And once, you know, we, we could handle that when we had 20, 30, 50, 100 for that matter. But once it started getting to the four, five, 600, um, we, we, we had a staff. So the, the, our county executive staff had to basically allocate about 15 people. And they were they were recruiting people on a daily basis. Anybody and anybody that they can grab, they were they were they were moving into this area, and we were setting up computers to do data entry. So they were taking these PDF documents that were written on by the nurses, and they were entering it into another system because they couldn't actually capture it directly from the state system because we didn't have an API that was available to us. Um, and one day, uh, one of the individuals had come across my office, and I heard him over speaking to my, one of my developers and said, "We got to screen scrape this." Um, uh, the, the state system, it's killing us right now. We can't, I said, whoa, whoa, wait. So wait a minute. I said, um, I said, you know, we had recently, uh, you know, interesting enough, had had a demo on RPA um, in, in the auspice of uh, kind of AI and whatnot. And I said, you know what? I said, let me, let's call that particular vendor in. And I'd be really interested in understanding how um, they might be able to solve this problem. And, you know, I, to be honest with you, I, I, I mean, I thought it would be, it might be able to help. I wasn't really sure exactly. They came in. We showed it to them in an hour. Within 11 days, we had the entire process set up, um, automated, and in production handling 1,500 cases on a daily basis. We, we, we took those 15 people that were ultimately working from approximately 10 in the morning till upwards to 10 o'clock at night, um, every, and we, we reallocated them to doing the things that they were, were needed to do from a value perspective as opposed to data entry. Um, going back, I think, to Jim, what, what, what Jim had indicated initially here is that uh, these tasks were, while they were, they were important and they were necessary, you know, we had, you know, highly, you know, highly skilled people doing this because it was, you know, everyone else was stretched. Um, so it was a, a, such an amazing um, implementation, and it really opened up my eyes to, to what was available here. Um, so we, we, you know, we certainly, you know, took that and continued on that. And there were, there's been so many opportunities through um, through COVID, um, you know, relative to working with these different types of state systems um, that have been um, that are that are that are great from a resource st standpoint, and they capture so much information and, and available, but very difficult, at least from from our perspective, in in, in pulling data from. So, um, you know, so this has been one of the, you know, the, the, that was really what got us started and we've been going ever since relative to it. So at this point in time, we have, you know, four bots going on a regular basis. Some bots are, are, are managing multiple tasks. Um, we've, we've expanded it to our district attorney's office. 
um, you know, into our, obviously our health department um, we've been working on. We're going, we're working right now with our budget office. We're working with our real property division um, and expanding upon uh, the different needs that they're identifying um, for us and trying to capture that and, and to expand upon the overall program. Uh, as uh, we recently renewed our, our licensing and, 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 it, and increased our total amount of bots that are available. And we really are looking forward to, uh, you know, kind of expanding upon that, um, you know, moving into this year. Nice. So I do have two questions in the q and I'm going to go ahead and keep continue to push on on our script just to get through our next two panelists. But then we're going to stop because one of these I just can't can't hardly wait to hear you guys answer. So um, thanks for that information, Scott. David, let's um, let's look at you. Everything's bigger in Texas, so we needed two people to tell the Texas story today. Uh, why did the end user services of Texas Attorney General's office, because that doesn't sound like some monstrous size 40,000 office, why did you turn to RPA? What, what bots are, are, are doing, what are bots doing yeah. for you and what's been the impact? Well, the Office of the Attorney General, we refer to ourselves as the largest law firm in the state of Texas. We have 5,000 employees. Uh, most of those are attorneys or child support officers. And uh, we, we do a, a significant amount of business runs through our child support division. We uh, just this past year set a new record for the United States of uh, $4.2 billion running through the child support, collecting child support on behalf of the children for the state of Texas. So uh, it, it is a pretty big operation. I happen to be just the point guy for uh, for our business customers in the child support division to say, I, I need a technology solution. So the scenario a year ago, uh, in about March of last year, we, we already had a chat bot. Uh, you could go onto our portal. Uh, if you are a, a non-custodial parent or a custodial parent or an employer and the like, uh, you could go onto our portal and you could uh, submit a Q&A to the chat bot. Uh, we had several people spending six of their time, sixty percent of their time, responding to chats. They did have scripted responses for sixty-three distinct topics. Uh, but then last year in April, with COVID, when our customers could no longer come into the office and meet with our child support officers or their attorneys, the backlog of chats. This is just the backlog was growing at two thousand messages per day. Uh, we increased the staff to 45 people full-time responding to chat and the backlog still wasn't shrinking. So we had a pretty significant problem that needed to be solved very, very quickly. So the solution is uh, on May 15th of last year, we implemented a robot to automate chat responses based on that keyword match. Uh, with those 63 different topics, we were able to automate 29 of those uh, based on the keyword. Uh, so depending on the keywords detected by the bot, it provides the scripted response in an automatic response to the chat. The, and, 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 and that's not rocket science. Actually, the uh, logic is stored in an Excel spreadsheet. The bot references an Excel spreadsheet. So if our business users decide that the response, the canned response needs to be modified, they can change it themselves. They don't need to send it to IT. We don't need to do a deployment plan or a re release plan or a change management process to get it changed. They can do it themselves uh, pretty, pretty easily, quite honestly. The success rate is up to 80% of the chats that come in through the portal are automated. Now, on average, it's about 45%, but it does go up to 80%. Uh, that translates into real staff time and return on investment. So I'll spend a couple seconds talking about the impact. Uh, the manual process on average was three to five minutes per chat. A bot does it in 10 seconds. The time savings, if you translate is 2.8 to 4.8 minutes per transaction, just for the backlog, the 2000 messages per day at the 45% average automation rate, that's between 42 and 72 hours per day. That's five to nine full-time employees every single day. That turns into some real cost savings, but more importantly, into better customer service. Uh, in terms of implementation, it took two and a half days to implement. It was that straightforward. Now, to get it to scale, um, we had to go through some extra formal procurement processes and uh, 
uh, acquire some expertise from UiPath, and and that took a little bit of extra time. Once you try to uh, try to secure budget and uh, resources, the timeline sometimes grinds to a halt. But that was that's not a technical constraint. That's a business constraint, rather. Uh, I see Krishna is smiling because he's tr he's working very, very hard across the state of Texas to fix that problem for all 200 plus Texas agencies. Um, so, you know, it took two and a half days to implement. Uh, it, we save between five and nine full time employees per day. And, and then of course the side benefit is robots are always consistent and robots work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we actually have to let our employees sleep and go to the bathroom every once in a while. So uh, the, the, the benefits were extremely clear. And I think in a few minutes, I'll be able to share a little bit more about where, where our next steps are taking us. But that was, that was what got us into bots. Thanks, David. And, and, and you know, earlier I mentioned the, the idea about automation and I, the, the math on the numbers is important. You were getting value from chatbots before you ever looked at RPA or anything mm -hmm. else. When you add the, the RPA to it, you exponentially improve the value of your chatbot. In addition to the fact that you have RPA working with it, the bot doesn't have to only work with the chatbot. So it can do other work for you. And so mm -hmm. if you tie that with AI, you tie that with natural language processing, it's not like it used to be where you bought a, a ticketing system, ServiceNow or Remedy. And the only thing it could do was ServiceNow or Remedy. Right. Now what you can do is say, hey, I've got a problem where an employee is working with their screen and their mouse, and they have a couple of decisions to make or a database or two to log into to check. And you can give that to the bot. And so, like I said, I'm chomping at the bit for this, Jim, this question. Jim, you're, you're, you're taking away my thunder on that one. Uh, when, we that talked about our, when, when we talk about my future uh, plans for bots, I'll talk more about service desk and those kind of things. Sounds good. Thank you. And uh, Steve, let's, to close out our midterm sessions here, we spoke with your CIO uh, last year, Jack, and he's a great guy. Uh, clearly not as good or as smart or as good looking as you are, but, but he's still a good guy, right? You can't, you can't fault him for that. Uh, your program started during COVID. Can you share your story, challenges, and what you're seeing in your bots? Absolutely, Jim, and thank you for the compliment. That was very nice of you, but Jack looks as smart and uh, intelligent as you know, I do. Uh, so I don't want to take away any credit for him. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it today, so he sent me as his representative. Uh, but like most of the people, our story started during the COVID crisis uh, as well. But I want to take a few months before that to set the stage uh, we being the innovation arm of the judiciary, we are always constantly in the lookout for the, the technology out there in the marketplace, uh, what we could bring in and how it would add value to the business and something that piqued my interest has been RPA. And I, when I scanned the landscape, I saw the meteoric rise of UA Pack uh, in, in, in about a year or so and uh, reached out. And uh, just with one junior developer, we were able to get going. We did not depend on any external service providers. It was just us with one junior developer who was curious to learn new technologies. And uh, UAPAC was kind enough to sweeten the deal. They offered us a starter package. So we got an, uh, on an entry into the UAPAC software with about 50,000, I would say, three unedited bots and few studio licenses and few attended bots. Uh, that was good to go. I mean, we were good to go with that. And we had no clue what we were in for because this was pre-pandemic. Uh, we, we had no clue. Uh, we just got it. We, we wanted to experiment with it. We wanted to... Uh, pick a great use case, you know, what we call as an MVP, the most valuable uh, process to automate. And then boom, uh, we got hit with a pandemic. As it happened at most of our lives, uh, our code operations cannot stop because we have to continue to serve justice no matter what goes on. That's a critical piece um, of the public and the society. So the chief justice had a mandate to continue the business operations. Right? We had a 9,000 member uh, code operation and everybody gone virtual with all the hearings and the code uh, process happening online. Most of our systems were digitized already, we are paper free, but there are few areas which are still face-to-face. -face. One of the things uh, that struck us is some of the municipal code payments, right? Municipal codes is the largest code operation. We have 530 municipalities, each one has its own local municipal code and they accept payments for complaints. This is the high traffic, high volume code. Uh, we have over 6 million cases filed every day and there are payments that are need to be made for municipal complaints. 
And we estimate about 15 million in payments coming in annually on this. And there is no way we can stop that payment process. And we had no way to accept the payment online. So our options were very limited, right? Number one, we had to think of a brand new solution from ground up, build an entire payment integration with our legacy system, which is 30, 40 years old, and test, roll out, train, and then implement a solution. We estimated about 12 weeks, assuming all hands on the deck to provide the solution. It would cost us about a million dollars to do this. The second option is to repurpose an existing payment solution, which is built for another system, and then capture the data over there and have a code staff, one per count, I mean, uh, one per municipality, which is about 530 staff on a daily basis, full time dedicated to receive the payments, just do this swirl chair operation, turn around to the next screen or the monitor and be able to go into the other system and log in or, or enter the payment data into the, uh, uh, the complaint system to fulfill the payment needs, right? So these two options were not looking good for us because both would take us months uh, to train, to implement, and then we are looking at 530 staff doing this full time. We, we did not simply have the luxury to afford that, right? Uh, that's the moment we had the FFNE. Uh, we, we, we did not think about this nice neat tool that we had re recently procured, and it was like a Goldilocks uh, scenario for automation, right? We had the tool, we had our staff, and we had the opportunity, and we had to come up with a solution very fast. Um, so we had you know, we quickly assembled to implement the solution using UFAT. It took us two weeks time to market, uh, Jim. That's all it took us, two weeks time to market. We had a solution in place. We did not have to train the staff. We simply created one bot that was able to constantly monitor, receive the uh, payments as they come in, and then log into the alternate system, the legacy system, enter all the payment details and fulfill everything that we need. So we got the business going uh, got up and running on the feet in a matter of two weeks. So that uh, I would consider uh, showed the power of automation to the entire organization in a span of like two weeks. Uh, that's at the stage for us. And I want to talk about the next automation, which is very similar, uh, high value automation that we are implementing right now. Uh, we got hit with a crisis because we are decriminalizing the marijuana in New Jersey. Uh, we were just told beginning July 1, marijuana is not a, a criminal crime anymore. So you're allowed to persist and consume marijuana under certain conditions, right? So uh, we have a domino effect with that. We have to go back and uh, undo a lot of case management operations that are being done across various systems, across the criminal courts, the probation, uh, family courts, municipal courts. We had to go into different case management systems. We had to unwind, right? Any cases that are scheduled, the calendars had to be clear. That had to be unwound. We had to clear up any payments. We had to free up people from prison. We had to uh, stop the probation monitoring. Every single system uh, we estimate a tsunami of data coming at us in the next six to eight weeks. And the only solution we had uh, is automation. Without uh, an automation, I don't even know how we would have solved this problem. So we estimate about 30,000 just in one system, uh, 30,000 cases, I say, just in one system to be cleared, right? And now we are looking at five or six systems and we are racing to meet the deadline. We're building the automations to solve this problem. And I'm looking forward uh, to have a success on this one as well. Thanks. That, that's a great example. Um, the IRS, you know, one, one of the things in federal, and, I, and I'm really focused on federal, so I have to, a lot of examples, is the, the number of federal employees who are willing to talk about the success that they're having with RPA. The chief procurement officer of the Internal Revenue Service recently published on their website the story of their automation. The, the National Defense Authorization Act, which you think of Department of Defense, directed the IRS to add a paragraph of text into every contract that they had, some 2,100 contracts that they needed to go into, to insert this text in a certain way, in a certain place. And the, the procurement officer, chief procurement officer, did the calculations and said, this is gonna take us about two years to do. When they applied an automation first mindset to it on, hey, instead of doing this manually, how can we save ourselves? They took two weeks to build the automation and three days to run it and the work was done, right? And so that I think is a perfect little example that's gonna lead us into this question for all four of you and feel free anybody that wants to jump on this. On the other side of your examples, RPA is doing the work so fast, it means that you don't need that many people. Is RPA killing your workforce 
or does RPA get embraced by your workforce or so far is so new you don't know? Uh, I'll take that, Jim, if you don't mind. Please. Our our uh, our business customers, to our business customers, it's so new that they don't know. But I have been able to see firsthand since I'm on the front lines of, of what the bots are doing, I'm able to see that the benefit is to our employees. It's not that we're displacing our employees or uh, it, it's that we're reducing their workload, we're reducing their repetitive rules driven tasks. And now they're not so stressed out. They don't have such a backlog behind them. And the uh, even if we don't reduce our workforce, the satisfaction of our employees has increased because they're not so overwhelmed and in crisis mode all the time simply because the volume has decreased. But I'll, I'll tell you in a minute how, how we intend to um, uh, defer or uh, uh, redeploy staff during our reduction uh, in, in transactions. And, you know, and I can also, if you like, from my perspective, I mean, no question that, you know, we had a number of people embrace um, you know, this and, and, and ultimately we're extremely pleased with, it, with the results that it was able to, to bring forth to, to the county itself. But a lot of those folks were, you know, more of the, you know, again, we talked about the county executive, we talked about the district attorney's office, folks that are uh, more on the, you know, kind of the, we'll call them from a county perspective or government exempt employees. Um, you know, I'm not going to say that we, do, we certainly don't have individuals that have been doing things for a number of years that are somewhat antiquated. And I kind of, somebody coined a phrase here in the county that uh, almost a little bit like Stockholm syndrome, they fall in love with these bad, bad processes. They really feel it's the only way that it can get done. And they don't understand that there's another way. So that certainly has been a challenge for us is to try to educate those folks and, uh, and make them understand that, listen, number one, there's a better way to do it that's going to make you happier. And number two, we're going to find plenty of things for you to do um, outside of that particular task, because there's things that have been burning a hole in, in people's, uh, you know, in, in people's task books, if you will, that just haven't been able to get done because we're doing all these other things that are not bringing any, any true value, um, you know, to the organization, to the department. Uh, Krishna, Sipu, anything on it? Um, yeah, I, I would like to add a few points as well. And uh, first, I want to say to go ask this question, that's a great question, because um, one of the things that we do, Jim, is we meet with, uh, we, we do a door-to-door -door -door campaign, uh, automation campaign, I should say. And one of the uh, questions that we are constantly asked about of a topic that definitely comes up in every single meeting is this particular question, right? This is the elephant in the room. And we address anyone with this automation, artificial intelligence, any of these uh, disruptive technologies. And what is going to happen to my job? Is this going to replace me? Uh, Gartner study tells us that based upon their analysis and speaking with different uh, vendors and customers, they think uh, it is going to create more jobs. It is not going to replace any job. In the example that we had in the course, uh, it was above and beyond what our code staff could deliver, right? Uh, it is not replacing the existing staff. It is creating a digital workforce for us that would augment the existing staff it would empower them, like sort of give them the super power strengths. It's not a terminator, it's a transformer. It gives people the super power strengths to do more uh, with the limited time and um, you know, tools that they have in their disposal. So when they saw that real time and they saw the real example, oh, you know what, this, is, this didn't take away anyone's job because this is something new that created, created the situation. And we didn't want to go and hire 50 people just to do to data entry work. We got this robots doing all of this uh, like David said, 24 by seven, no holidays, no tea breaks or no vacations. So that was phenomenal. And once they saw that value proportion, they bought into it. Gotcha. Yeah, for us, uh, another thing that we needed to do in Texas was that we need to have the legislature, you know, approving AI as part of the, you know, task that we do that was done two years ago. And that was a big plus. Then the executive, uh, you know, support, the, the state strategic uh, survey or state strategic uh, document called AI and automation as the three goals. And that helped the next level of, you know, you know if, you, if you do that, you know, everything is mapping. And then it was very easy for us to launch and get the effort and work with the agencies to say that, look, look at this technology. And one of the big tasks for us was, you know, there was not fear, but there was the, the, the unknown, right? So you need to, you know, kind of you know feel it and we were able to work together with you know UiPath and many other industry leaders and make sure there were a lot of sessions we are offered as training so that people can go and quickly you know 
get some quick training and do hands-on. And in an hour, I have a, in an hour and a half, I have another session where 100 people are registered for a you know invitation-only uh, hyper automation session. So so people are joining all the sessions and getting that fear of unknown away, and they're also seeing it you know the the bot or the technology just like you know how we had initially when the computer came there was a big resistance so we see that but we, we are able to overcome uh, and one of the big challenges that we face is the procurement the, you know when i excite some people and then they say i want to use it yeah, there is no technology yeah yeah the, the contract to do use the technology is not available and people ask me why uapath because uapath was able to procure that license and have that license to do business with all the Texas agencies. That's why you know David was able to quickly go and e implement the technology. And we have an AI center of excellence built. You know, it was officially kicked off in December, mainly to help take this fear out and show and do hands-on training and make sure that you know we have a clear path for everyone so that you know they happily follow the path and understand that hey, these are digital assistants. This will make your life better. You can sleep more or you know you don't have to work weekends. And also, I like what George Rios, the, the CIO for Park and Wildlife said, he had employees or team members who were doing five tasks. And he said, look, if I can take two tasks away, they can do the three things very well. And Scott, let me get one quick question that came specifically to you. Uh, what types of automation levels are you seeing around data extraction for handwritten documents? And are you using an OCR solution of any kind? So we, this is something that's recent for us. So we, we, you know, in our, in our, we have a real property um, tax service agency that's responsible for verifying all various uh, property related documents. And it's verified against a, a, an address and a mapping uh, tax map lot number. And, um, you know, there's a lot of handwritten stuff in, in that, um, obviously in those documentations. And one of the things we're doing is we try to combine the, um, the, 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 the robotics with AI in an attempt to try to, you know, do some, some manned robots that will enable us the ability to bring certain, you know, the exceptions, uh, as Jim alluded to initially, um, you know, to, the, to, to an individual where they can ultimately make a decision. Um, there certainly is some challenges related to um, the, the, the OCR, and we, we're running into a few of those challenges, but uh, in the same respect, it's, it certainly seems um, and we're, we're encouraged by some of the, the things that we're seeing, and we believe that it's a, it's a path forward that will enable us the ability to begin to, you know, look at, um, you know, handwritten documents and begin to OCR them intelligently and, and bring them into the fold. Perfect. Thanks. So um, we're at about, what, uh, 45 after. So we're going to move forward, um, asking each of you to, to shorten just a little bit. So let's start, Siva. Um, what about your RPA program? Where do you see it going 12, 18 months? Uh, sure. Now that we have proved the technology, Jim, our next step is to create a platform, right? We are doing, I would say, classify this as three major, it's a multi-pronged strategy and the three major ones that I want to highlight. Uh, first thing and the most important thing some of my, uh, my co-speakers here touched upon is the literacy component. That to me is the uh, holy grail that we are after right now. So once we educate the, uh, the organization on the benefits of the automation, um, it makes it our job very, very simple and easy to implement it. So what we are doing right now uh, is we are creating multiple programs uh, to enable that. So we are doing road shows, we are doing knocking on people's doors, we are doing door-to-door -door campaign, we are showing the automations. We have four uh, in production right now, and we are, we are showing them, we are demoing them, we are giving them ideas, we are sparking innovation within the uh, group, and then we are recruiting, uh, um, you know, very influential uh, people who could champion the idea at the local level. Uh, we wanted to do that uh, for multiple things, right? First is to eliminate the fear and uncertainty and the doubt around this entire thing, like Krishna mentioned, we wanted to do that. Uh, second thing is to let people know this tool is here to help and we have a new tool out here and you can do instead of five, three things really well. Uh, so that have, we have seen great, um, um, you know, people have been welcoming that message very well. We have reached out, I would say about 25% of the organization. We are doing that municipality level, reaching out to each team and doing this. This is a very painful, um, and added to us task, but we are committed to get there, right? That's the first thing. The second thing is we are creating an RPA COE, the Center of Excellence Group at, um, itself. And the primary goal over there is uh, to, to uh, source, to crowdsource ideas on automation. We're creating a pipeline for people to submit ideas and then the COE is going to uh, review, approve and uh, enable uh, automation. And our goal, 
uh, is to see if we could localize the automation. That's the third point that I'm going to touch upon. So with RPA, we wanted to create the uh, governance. We wanted to create the necessary training and the tools uh, for the team. We wanted to provide a platform for everybody to exchange ideas and thought process. And then finally, uh, the tortilla around the barrito would be the governance that we wanted to establish to bring everything together, the governance and security. So that's what I'm working on right now to establish an RPA COE. And the third point is to recruit uh, citizen developers at the local level, right? This is another key thing. We, our team doesn't want to be the bottleneck. We don't want to be creating all the automation. So uh, one thing that I joke around is UiPath is so simple that even a caveman could do it. Uh, so what I do is uh, I tell uh, people, okay, if you have any curious minds, anyone who wants uh, to do something different from their uh, monotonous routine job, here is something that people could pick up and run with. So with UiPath Studio X, I think that's a game changer, right? It's like people having a Microsoft Office installing every desktop, you could buy Studio X licenses, you could throw it out there and people could start experimenting with. So that's the third thing, recruiting local uh, champions to run with this program. So these are the three things we'll be doing in the next six months, Jim. Amazing, hey, thanks. So David, I'm gonna unleash you. You've been dying to talk about your future. Get on mute. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm off mute now. Uh, we have a backlog of 33 chatbot initiatives uh, and bot initiatives and, and the primary use cases continue to be responding to customers and password resets, right? The low hanging fruit uh, of the automation world. Um, for customer response, we plan to take the logic that we used for the portal chatbot and extend it to our website. On our website, if you wanna ask anyone anything, you can submit a form on the website and we're gonna take the same keyword logic that we've already implemented and expand it to the website. Um, that's a small use case. A bigger use case is our virtual agent, uh, chatbots and supporting bots for our IT service desk, uh, integrating those into ServiceNow. We expect to be able to, initial, to initially automate about 24% of service desk tickets, that's incidents and service requests. And uh, because of that, we expect to be able to reduce service desk staff by 20%. In fact, we've already taken two of our staff from the service desk and reassigned them to RPA. They are our center of excellence for robotic process automation. They are now our developers. Um, and so uh, with bots on our service desk, our business customers will receive quicker responses and our service desk isn't so overwhelmed with uh, repetitive tasks. Uh, the prototype for that is complete. We expect to be able to implement it um, before the end of August. Uh, the, another exciting area that we're pursuing is microservices, using bots to provide microservices such as uh, for any customer interaction, customer verification, triage, routing and transfers, routine inquiries, complaints. We expect to implement those for the chat bot first, but then we expect to be able to reuse those bots, whether the customer engages us through the portal, through interactive voice response, over the web, via email, whatever the channel may be. Um, so uh, the those microservices is, I think, our agency's next generation of bots where we're moving. Wow, crazy interesting. Thank you. Glad, glad that we unleashed you and let you out of that one. Thank you. Um, I'll shut up now. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, Scott, where are you going with your program? So similar to Siva, you know, is that you know, it's a matter of educating our our user group, our business community here, and, and making them understand, you know, what the capabilities are. I mean, I, I'll be honest, uh, as I admit, you know, I had seen some initial, um, you know, demonstrations, and 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 it was it was difficult initially to grasp. Um, you know, where this could take us and, and how it could ultimately benefit. And I certainly didn't see the potential um, as I know it today um, in those first few uh, demonstrations. So we've been working on, you know, a roadshow where we have an opportunity to demonstrate some of the use cases that, you know, obviously are, are, are relevant here in the county that people can relate to um, and, and begin to understand uh, where some of the needs are in these other um, it is other departments in these other areas so that we can begin to build a pipeline. We have recently expanded our, our, our footprint, if you will, on the UiPath uh, technology that to enable uh, the ability for, for folks to go ahead and submit in requests. And that's something we want to be able to take advantage of so that um, they'll have that opportunity where we can look at it, we can evaluate it. Um, and then furthermore, you know, expanding upon our staff, uh, you know, David, uh, it's unbelievable how you're able to, you know, repurpose 
um, some of your tech staff to, you know, to dedicate them to RPA. And we similarly have a, a service desk that I have a few folks on and, and I, and I'd love to just listen to what you're saying. I'm learning stuff here today, which is amazing. And I'm going to begin to see how we can implement those types of, um, you know, activities just within, within our service desk. Um, so, you know, we are, while we have been doing it for a while, it's been very purpose specific to a lot of the COVID related things and, and things that are of, of, of high importance that are being, you know, brought to my attention, but there's, you know, now it's a matter of, we just scratch the surface. So that's where we want to get to in the, in the next few months. Nice. So, you, so you're saying that you have to do some internal marketing. Correct. Yes, exactly. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, Kirsten, what are you doing? Where's Texas going with this? So, you know, I'm very happy that, you know, David uh, talked a lot about the numbers and how it is impacting. And one of the biggest challenge, uh, three goals I have, one is evangelism in the sense, you know, you know, why part, right? So imagine that that queue that David was talking about 2000 or so, 80% of them, you know, if I understood that, you know, maybe the password reset and things like that, right? So imagine a caseworker going from one to uh, the last and 2000 may be the, the, the case where you need, to, you need a critical child support need, right? And you prioritize quickly and they bring them in the front of the queue so they are addressed. So, so the life matters here. And Department of Family Protective Services, Health and Human, you know, imagine, you know, COVID test, you know, all of those things, you know, why we do it, we are saving life, right? If, if, a, if a person is able to test faster, he's getting the cure faster. So that is a message that we are giving why we have to do faster, right? So, so we save lives and we make life easy, uh, make the benefits come early, those kind of things. The second thing is the what part, you know, I want, to do, and I want you all to understand, I know a lot of, you know, vendor partners are listening as well. Uh, through the cooperative contracts that DAR operates, we did last year $2.58 billion of technology business. The IT funds for the 200 or agency that David already alluded to is about you know, $3.18 billion. So if you add the two, and if you only round up to a $6 billion, in the next five years, it's a $30 billion market right here in Texas. And we only have few players who do who have license to do business with agencies. So in that effort, we are bringing out a a a, a common high level uh, uh, procurement license, if you will. And you will soon see that come on our website. So you all can apply. So the agencies don't have to go and buy technology from one vendor, and again go to a procurement cycle and buy services from a second vendor. And that those challenges will be all gone by this one, and we will be very competitive. And those people who don't have the license can also have a level playing field by obtaining that license. That'll be like a uh, multi-vendor uh, license. We don't have the terms. You may have to, you know, if you're going to do business with David, you may have to go and sit with them and, you know, or, you know, strike the terms, but the high level pass, the fast pass, you know, you will have it. And the third thing is that we have two data centers that is, you know, having about 7,500 servers and supporting 28 agencies and about 400 customers who use shared technology services. And we are very seriously looking at making RPA as a service in the sense every agency don't have to go and stand the orchestrator and have their own bot and have their own, you know, do everything, but they will be able to subscribe bots and stand it up pretty quickly and, and do that, uh, uh, you know, faster. It's not too easy. We have a lot of, you know, policies and procedures and checks and balances, you know, you know, the the governments run that way, but we will get through that and you know, make sure that you know the offering is uh, you know getting moved to the next level. And those are my my three goals. And the last one always is training people. You know, it's, it's once they get on the training and once they know, like you know, I saw Siva was talking about it. Once people get to it, you know, they are hooked onto it. And Texas has got a great program that the commissioner uh, of TWC, Chairman Brian. Uh, has uh, Brand Daniel has said, you know, reskilling, right? Imagine if 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 the third 550,000 employees of Texas, the, the full-time employees, if they at least get the level of knowledge, you know, the online knowledge a, a middle schooler has, they can easily get to the next level. So so the people at that level, middle level, can move to the next level. So we create a lot of low-level jobs while reskilling and getting the the people to do cool things. Nice, appreciate it. That's twice you've used cool. I haven't heard cool in a while. You know. yeah. we, so we, we, we are close to the top of the hour. What I'd like to do is, is go around to each of you with the same question. Um, and, and the question is gonna be, 
uh, when someone listens to this ATARC webinar on demand a couple of weeks from now, and they hear you, what's the one lesson learned that you want them to take away from, from what you've seen with RPA? And could you also let our audience know how if they're interested in communicating with you, what's the best social media or email address or whatever um, that, that they can reach out to you to talk to you about your program? And so David, let's start with you if we could, sir. After you, you come on mute. mute. After I come off mute, yes. Yes, sir. That's the, that's the one thing you need to take away is always come off mute. Uh, no, the, the, the one thing, the, the one takeaway is that it's easier to implement than you think it will be, but it's harder to govern than you think it will be. Because if you don't have strong governance around your bots, you're going to have bot sprawl and you won't be able to control them, especially once you open it up to user developed bots or even citizen developed bots. That governance is going to be key. Uh, if you want to reach out to me uh, and, and get some more info, I'm at david.brandon at oeg.texas.gov. Perfect. Thank you. Steven, what about you? What's your one big RPA lesson? Mute? You've got David's mute button on your... Oh, good. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Apologies. I was going to say um, one takeaway would be um, automation is basically not a terminator, right? I mentioned this point. It is a transformer. So educating people and getting them buy-in uh, is critical. It's, it's very, it's, I would say it's a foundation for your successful RPA program. And identifying the MVP, the most valuable process to automate it. Not every process is a candidate for automation. Identifying the one that's going to give you the maximum impact is critical. So that would be my takeaway. And if people want to contact or connect with me, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, uh, Siva, Siva Kumar.apavu. And then you could email me at siva.apavu at njcodes.com. Very good. Thank you, sir. Scott, your lesson? You know, one thing, it, it, get started. Um, you know, I don't care how small it is, but get it started. Um, and, you know, I have had conversations with folks, you know, um, you know, locally here in different counties that said, you know, how are you doing this? And I said, listen, I got RPA going with this. And they're like, oh, it's too late for us. We don't have the money. We, I can't believe that you had that, you know, you were able to get it started back then. So, I mean, and we started while it was relatively large. Um, in, endeavor, you can start so small, um, get it started, get it in play, and you can all, it, it will expand. I guarantee it. Um, there's so many things that, um, that you can do with this. Get one person trained in it, get one company you're comfortable with, whatever the case may be, um, start small and, and let it grow. And as far as getting in touch with me, uh, you know, LinkedIn is, is certainly a way you can get in touch with me, uh, but I also have my address here. My email is scott.mastalon um, at Suffolk County NY, that's all one word, dot gov. Very good, Scott. Thanks. And um, Krishna, what, thank what's you. Take away. Yeah. Yeah. I think I got three, you know, three of them that I had already taken. But I would say focus, you know, the human in the middle, right? You cannot do, you know, Jim was alluding to when we early signed in on, you know, why, you know, it's focus on the people. Uh, it's not technology, you know, we have support, but you know, you have legislature, everything, but but it is the people that you need to focus. Care of them. Uh, and make sure that why you know, why pause, you know why you are doing it and why they should do it why it will add value to them why it, it'll, they will grow their resume you know it's personal right at the end of the day uh, sometimes so so you coach them in that that way and you all can contact me at krishna at dot idathil at dir dot texas dot gov and you can also look me up on linkedin uh, you know wanted to thank you for all listening and, and like like scott mentioned it's like swimming you need to jump into the pool. You cannot, you know, take a, 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 a online lesson or, you know, you cannot do anything, you need to jump. So, so I would say jump, jump in and, you know, there will be people there to help. And like my boss says, John Hoffman, who is a CTO and CIO here, deputy CIO in Texas says, don't be the last and don't be the first, but we are here already, but jump in. So, so that's what, you know, I would say. Super. So <laughs> I was just going to add on to what Krishna said. Just make sure you don't jump in the deep end of the pool. Yep. yep. Start at the shallow end. Yep. Not, not, no disagreement there. So, gentlemen, I said at the very beginning of this that, that this was going to be a treat. It, it really was. You know, I had a, a hundred notes that we could have gone on earlier. I really appreciated our audience asking some really good questions. It generated some 
some good back and forth. And so with that, I will say thank you and turn it back over to our HR team. Awesome. Thank you to our panelists and our moderator. And for those of you who attended today's event, they had some wonderful questions. So really great to be a part of this. And we will send out a final wrap up email afterwards once our video is uploaded to the ATAR YouTube channel where you can watch it on replay. And um, thank you all again. If anyone in the audience has questions for me about how to get involved at ATARC, you can reach out to me. You should have my email if you registered, but I'll be including that in the email wrap up as well. So everyone have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. All. Thank you everyone. Bye. David, that was good.